Palisade Radio is preparing to release an in-depth report on the fundamentals of uranium, including our top three picks for 2019. Sign up today at palisaderadio.com to be the first to receive our exclusive report. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell, and we are returning for part three of our uranium Focus series. If you missed part one and part two, we had Mike Alkin of Sachem Cove Partners on to discuss the fundamental picture for uranium and why he thinks now is at an inflection point for the uranium market to turn. And to follow up on that conversation, a returning guest and favorite guest of the program, Daniel Major. He's the CEO of Goviax Uranium. Daniel, welcome back to the program. Hey, Colin, uh, always a pleasure. I love these conversations. Well, part of this series is about offering listeners different lenses through which to observe the uranium market. There are, of course, ex- exploration-focused companies. There's companies in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, there's companies focused in South America. There's producers. And then there's where Goviex falls in, which is a development company. And what that means is you're working on different kinds of internal documents, things like pre-feasibility and feasibility studies. You're working with governments actively for permitting purposes. You're working with banks for financing, utilities for offtake partners. So I think it gives you uh, a a great deal of information on where the market's at. So why don't we start there? Uranium price is obviously starting to move up and some of the associated stocks. What's your sense of where the market's at right now? Uh, we see it very much now on um, an upward trend. Um, we've had a couple of bounces here, but I think this is each one was testing a new piece of information. Um, I think what you've seen, you've seen a steady growth in uh, nuclear energy production. I mean, it troughed at the low in 2013 and since then has been picking up very solidly. You've got the fastest growth of reactor builds in the last 25 years and increasing. You've had production cuts come through now that we're actually substantially in a, in a, a primary production deficit. Um, and you've got major producers holding out production and extracting metal from the inventory market, um, squeezing down that inventory and seeing what the depth of price is in it. Th- these are all big changes. You're seeing reduction in the supply from secondary either through reduction in government sales or as more reactors come on stream, particularly in Japan, they're taking up capacity within the enrichment um, side of the market. You've had enrichment production cuts. That's the underfeeding side being squeezed as well. So both on the primary side and the secondary side, you're getting the squeeze coming through. And at the same time, you know, you've got utilities looking out there who have some inventory now they're okay um but those inventory levels are already declining in europe and in the us and you've got those contracts about to unwind so i I think we're in a you know all of the pressures that were on negative have now been taken away and we actually have a whole set of different pressures in the market are now pushing towards squeezing this price higher um i think the key is really going to be what cameco is doing in there and pulling inventory uh, and testing inventory pricing um, and I think, you know, that's going to be the interesting part. You know, as many of your listeners will understand when they're buying equity, you know, there's depth in the equity price. It only takes one buyer to come in and push for dem- push for that equity. And suddenly you're finding that guys only want to sell at a much higher price and the whole bid off of spread changes quickly. Daniel, looking at both sides of the coin, so the bull case, which you've just made, but also the bear case, is there anything at this point that remains negative for uranium or something that um, could pop up that could continue to put downward pressure on the price? Um, I think if you look from a fundamental point of view, no, I think time is going to be the longest problem for most people, which is how long is this this going to take? Uh, Is this going to be a quick turnaround or is this going to be a slow drag? Um, A lot of that is going to be really down to how much inventory in there. Um, I saw UXC were, you know, kind of intimating that it's somewhere between 20 and 30 million pounds in the spot market available um, that could be tradable. Um, what that depth is, um, we don't know. And I think that's really what Cameco is trying to work out for themselves. Um, uh, there's always risk as well that once the price starts to go that, you know, some producers start to come back and they come in too early and that puts pressure in the market. Um 
But no, I, I don't think so. I think the other thing that's sitting out there as well, of course, is the fact that you know, I think most people generally uh, believe that Section 232 has, has kind of pushed a whole buying section away from the market with the U.S. utilities. Um, how long they stay away and, and the pressure that they may revert back when they come in is going to be interesting to see. Um, and hopefully that gets clarified sooner rather than later. Um but I certainly think we've got a, a good step forward. Um, and the other thing to remember is we still have the long term big macro issues here, which is, you know, you've got something like 20 percent of world production is going to shut in the next five to 10 years because it's run out of resource to dig. Um, and that that still is an issue for the industry um, that it has to deal with. And, and the current price is, is not good enough to justify um, production coming on stream at this price. So. Um, the big, the big factors still still exist out there. Uranium and the nuclear industry is a very opaque market. It's also difficult for someone on the outside to understand. And you mentioned that it only takes one buyer to really get things moving. So, from a, a top kind of level point of view, how does this work with the utilities? The so utilities need to have a constant flow of enriched uranium coming in to fuel the plants. And where are they getting it from now, and why have they not been signing new contracts? They didn't need to sign contracts. If you looked at the sort of overall sales um, that were going spot and contract together, between 206 and 211, total volumes being traded was something like 240 million pounds a year at a time that the world was only consuming like 140 to 150 million pounds. So all that extra volume was actually just contracts that people were paying for upfront or agreeing to pay for, and then they would collect them later. Um, since 2011, that kind of fell off completely. And you've seen total volumes traded dropping all the way down in the spot market, for example, down to 40 million and no real contracts being traded at all. And so guys haven't had to come looking for metal because they'd already agreed with people like Cameco that they would collect it in the future. Uh, and that's that's the future now. What you've got is a situation in the US and in Europe, particularly which are two of the biggest contract markets, is that they're probably at 80 percent covered today and next year. But you look out another year and you're down to about 65 percent and you look out another couple of years and you're down to like 30 percent covered. Um, and so, you know, the guys have also had their inventory. They've been sitting with two to two and a half years of inventory, which is their normal holding position. But as already mentioned, those inventory levels are starting to drop. And so they're going to want to hold them at around that two year level. But they also want to be looking forward and saying, OK, where's my coverage coming from? Where am I going to get it? They didn't need to be in the spot market because they already had committed deliverables coming to themselves. Um, but that will start to change as well if they are starting to worry about where they're going to get their contracts from. And and you've got to remember here, the one thing that's not moving yet is the term contract price. And, and the rationale here is, look, if you're – if you're somebody who, like Cameco, whose book is already about $45 to $50, um, you need that price for the future to replace the resources that you're mining out today. And, you know, Cameco produced at about $30, um, if you look at their accounts. Cameco is not going to start selling material out at $30 if it needs to make sure it's got a price justifiable to replace its resources long term so that it knows it can deliver into contracts five to 10 years from now. So they're just going to sit back and say, I'm not selling. I want this price to be at a level that I can look at my long term strategy and make sure it meets those supply constraints that I've got. Um, and that's really what Cameco is about now. It's about squeezing that spot, clearing up the available material to ensure that the utilities, when they come in looking for material, one, can't find it in the spot market unless they want to pay for it, and two, will actually come to the table and start to negotiate proper long-term contracts again with the industry. Let's use Goviex's development plans as a bit of a case study to explain uh, what's going on in the market. So Maduella in uh, Niger is definitely the the project that you guys are most focused on. Uh, you're putting together a, a document, essentially a feasibility study that's going to outline how much money is required to build that mine. And then from there, you have to 
uh, try to lock in some long-term buyers and use that to go to a bank or some type of funding uh, group to secure the funding. So what, what kind of goes into that from the uranium market side? What is needed to make that work? It, it actually is a simultaneous equation, actually. The whole thing actually goes into a big loop. Um, the first thing, you know, we, we have one advantage uh, in this process. We already have the permit. So we're not somebody who has got to work through the whole process. And most companies sort of start with the banks and then still haven't got their permits. So they're waiting for their, their legal bit to get sorted out. We already have that. So what we're doing is we're working with the, the off takers, the banks and the feasibility study at the same time. And what we're doing is looking at the capital cost and the project and the operating costs and saying, all right, what are the benchmarks we need to achieve? Um, and on that basis, what is the loading of debt we can take? Because obviously that will then define the price that we need to contract in. So you can see, you know, that talking about is a fixed contract we're looking at contracts as collars so we want to be able to put a floor in that that's the lowest price we would ever sell at but there will be a higher price in there as well because then i can sit down with the banks and saying look you know that allows you to give me you know 140 million dollars at that price or 250 million dollars at that price of contract so it's somewhat circular um obviously the the lower the price that we can get the project to go at the higher the amount of debt because the lower amount of risk. Um, so it, hopefully that kind of is <laughs> circular comment, but that's exactly what it is. We, we are working strongly now of getting our CapEx down, getting our OPEX down so that the price that we need to justify the project can come in at a lower price. If we can get higher contracts, we can get a higher level of debt and reduce the equity financing that's required for the project. Okay, understood. And in a in a prior interview, maybe last year, we discussed companies that are best suited to take advantage of a uranium bull market uh, could be the companies that are closest to production. And uh, we looked at all the comps out there and um, made a pretty clear case that GoVX is the development story closest to production or at least up in the, the, the upper quartile. And you can compare that to um, uh, like a paladin from the last bull market, which of course had an epic run in share price. Um, so that's on, on the one side, but the other kind of thing in my mind right now is the uranium price today has implications today, but unlike other commodities, you're lock locking in um, kind of long-term pricing when you're building a mine. So it, it also dictates very much the price of tomorrow as well. Uh, absolutely correct. Um you know, that is exactly what this industry is looking for as well, is, is better stability in it. Um, you know, we've had these super spikes that jump up and down. That's not good for any commodity. Uh, you want, I mean, it's lovely for equity investors because you, you, get, you get to get in and get out clearly. But I mean, as an industry, we, we want secure long-term pricing that justifies the kind of investments that you've got to go through. Uh, I mean, Maduella, for example, is a 21 year mine life to start with. You know, we want to know that we're making a commitment um, to go through that process. Um, so, so it is pretty key that we kind of get in something that's solid long term pricing. Excellent. So let's finish up here giving a more specific update on GoVX. Many of our listeners are shareholders of GoVX and many people in the uranium business, if they have a development story in their portfolio, tend to have some amount of GoVX in their in their portfolio. So what, what can people expect over the next 12 months um, in terms of uh, news coming out and uh, advancement on the projects? Um, you'll see us. We've already announced the, the feasibility study start. Um, as we work through that and we can provide updates, we'll certainly be doing that. Um, more importantly, we're working with the banks as well to make sure that they're coming alongside us. So expect some announcements from us on where we are on the banking side going forward. Uh, we're working with the government as Niger as well to um, develop that partnership. Uh, and we're and you know people have always asked me about what it's like to work in Niger, and I'm, I said it's actually one of the easiest and best places to work. And I I think you'll see you know that relationship developing between us and the government as we go forward. Um, as well. So, you know, we're, we're moving into this. Um, we're not committing big, but what we're doing is committing 
as the price moves up, we'll commit larger and larger uh, to this project. We have our warrants out there. So as the price moves, you know, we can secure a lot of our financing from the, the accelerable warrants we've got. And that allows us to move this project forward quickly. Um, and, you know, we'll just keep giving updates on how fast we're going. Um, and it will be very clearly as the price goes up, we'll be moving with it. Excellent. Well, Daniel, thank you for coming on the program. A disclaimer to our audience, we are shareholders of GoVX. Daniel, I will look to get you back in uh, the next few months. Hopefully, uranium uh, gets out of this 26 to $28 per pound window and breaks out uh, up above 30 I think that's going to draw some real excitement into the market. Uh, I totally agree. I totally agree. I, I just add one add a, other comment for you, Colin. And I think one thing you're seeing as well is culturally a change towards nuclear as an acceptance. There's a lot more articles out there for your readers that can find showing it. And I think one of the highest lights for me was the fact that the WNA has now been invited into the United Nations Energy Council, whereas before nuclear was kept out of the World Bank forums, it's now being brought in that because it's become very clear it has to be part of that. So there has been a real cultural shift out there and we're seeing that price. I totally agree with you. I think we're going to see that jump up and as we've always said, you know, this is what GoVX is all about. It's getting its projects ready for when the price moves. We are in that process and we're moving forward with it. As the price accelerates, we'll accelerate with it. Excellent. Well, it does take a while for public sentiment to change on something as polarizing as nuclear power. I think the facts have been out there for a while, but it's good to see industry and uh, the public really grasping the power of uh, nuclear and the safety so hopefully that uh, continues to, uh, to uh, shift in public sentiment, and that'll just help the case more. Absolutely. And, and thanks for taking the time with me. I always appreciate our chats. Excellent. Thanks, Daniel. Take care. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?